Anyway, this is this is um, one of uh, my favorite uh, classes, uh, trees. Uh, I am a certified arborist, so uh, trees can be the most important thing we do in our landscaping. Uh, we can make huge mistakes planting trees. We can plant trees too close to buildings, walls, driveways, etc., and then the roots can crack and cause lots of problems. So there are mistakes that can be made when planting trees. So the tree should be given a lot of thought uh, before you uh, plant one. Now we're going to go in no particular order here, so don't think that the first tree is the best tree or the last one is the worst. That's uh, not the way we're going to do it here. We're going to start with some evergreen trees and, and some deciduous and, and finally palms because palms are part of the tree kingdom. So we're going to start with the olive and I think everybody's familiar with these uh, olive trees. Uh, they're very tough, very durable, very drought tolerant, uh, green all year. Uh, they do need space though and uh, you can see from this slide the size of that canopy and you can see the size of the trunk so you can imagine that the roots are quite large. I have seen the roots of these trees break through planters that were anything left less than about 12 feet uh, in diameter. Okay, There's a good example of the uh, trunk and you can see that one's in about a 14 a foot planter and uh, it's doing doing pretty well in there. They love the sun, love the heat and uh, unless unless you choose a non fruiting variety you will get fruit and uh, some people consider that to be a, a nuisance. The fruit can be a nuisance, can be messy. Uh, and there's a few dwarf types too that only grow as shrubs. Those uh, might be worth considering if you don't have room for a full size tree. Next, we're going to go to the crepe myrtle. I think we're all familiar with those. They grow in the Santa Clarita Valley quite well. What they love is sun and heat. They don't want to receive any shade. And they should be planted in the hottest place in the garden or in the yard. Uh, the lawn is not the uh, ideal spot for it. They come in multiple colors. They also come as a single trunk or multi-trunk, uh, both of which can be very pretty because of the uh, bark. After a number of years, the bark is uh, very pretty, uh, kind of a pinkish color. The colors, uh, every color, from reds to pinks to whites and lavenders. Next we have the Coast Live Oak. This is the evergreen oak uh, that we see all over the hills and valleys of Santa Clarita in Southern California. Uh, if you have one, then you probably know that tree is protected uh, by the city, the county, and the state. So uh, you have to be real careful with what you do with this tree. Uh, permits are typically required to do uh, pruning and other types of work on it. Obviously they're natives, so they're very durable. Uh, they actually go somewhat dormant in the summer. That's how they've learned to live here. Uh, they know that they're not going to get any rain in the summer, so they kind of shut down. So uh, you'll see here it says avoid pruning or fertilizing until summer because the summer period would actually be the dormant period for this tree. Now these trees are subject to some insects and some diseases. Uh, most of the diseases are caused by excess watering. 
So if we were to water the tree once a month, uh, I think it would be quite happy. So you can see one growing in the uh, cemetery there. Uh, not a good tree for a lawn area, of course, because we have to water our lawns in the summer. And you also see that it says keep the water off the base of the trunk. You do not want your sprinklers or watering irrigation system to hit the trunks of the trees. Uh, for if you have one, if you have a native oak, uh, you want to be pretty careful about what you plant under it and around it. There are some good plants, as you can see from the list here, and some bad plants. Some plants you absolutely do not want to plant underneath them. Okay. And uh, they do produce an acorn that the uh, squirrels and the, some of the birds like. Here's a cork oak, not a native, at least not to uh, Southern California, native to the Mediterranean region. Uh, this is the actual tree that they get cork from. If you look at this close-up of the trunk of the tree, uh, you'll see that the bark looks very much like cork. That's because that's what it is. And it can take extreme heat and uh, just has been used quite uh, successfully in Santa Clarita and elsewhere throughout Southern California. Has a little different leaf than the other types of oak. As you can see, it's kind of pointed here and not quite so uh, rigid around the side. Next is an Australian native, evergreen, by the way. Uh, kind of a nice tree, can develop a nice head on it. If you're uh, familiar with the Santa Clarita Valley, you'll find these growing on Railroad Street. The city has planted them from, oh, approximately the metro station up to near Circle J Ranch along Railroad Avenue. And uh, durable, don't seem to have uh, very many problems at all. You can see that this one's actually planted near a street. And uh, so they can take the heat that's radiated from the streets. But once again, they're drought tolerant and uh, have kind of a nice weeping effect. It makes them much, much, much better choices than say a pepper tree or a weeping willow. And they do produce some little flowers that uh, once again are not messy. Here's another native, the uh, sycamore, California sycamore. It's a very large tree, as you can see here, needs its own space. So uh, don't try to plant this in a small area. The uh, sycamore, has uh, some issues. It uh, There's a couple of diseases that you're almost sure to get if you plant a sycamore. A couple of insects also. There are other varieties of sycamore that don't have quite as many problems as the native. So if you were wanted to plant a sycamore, I might suggest that you use a different species other than the native. Here's a picture of their leaves, which never look great. They're never big and green and beautiful. Just uh, different than other trees. Uh, here's another tree you'll see throughout Santa Clarita, the Chinese flame tree. Uh, it is deciduous, it drops its leaves, it does get some beautiful flowers on it. Uh, but after the flowers, there's this lantern type of uh, growth that comes out there. It's uh, quite pretty. And you'll see this in the streets. You'll see it in the parkways. Uh, and it is planted there because it does not have a huge root system. That's very important. There you can kind of see the lanterns hanging off the tree. 
So good tree with a, a relatively large tree with a small root system. Next is a ginkgo. Uh, ginkgo, you know, is one of the oldest trees that we still have in existence today. They find fossils of this tree, which tells us it was uh, one of the earliest trees on Earth and was a predominant species uh, throughout the, uh, the whole world. Uh, it's, it's a slow grower, has a relatively small root system though. So while it can get quite tall, um, you can see here it's planted in a parkway. It uh, doesn't develop a huge root system. So that uh, that's an advantage for sure. So it's a good street tree a nice landscape accent. And there are the leaves, which are different from any other leaf, uh, kind of a, if you see the leaf, you'll see, oh yeah, I think I've seen uh, pictures of fossil that had that imprint on it. And it, uh, I should mention, by the way, that the ginkgo is a very clean tree. This next tree here, the albizia, is the uh, messiest tree on earth. This tree has the ability to drop something every single day of the year. It will drop leaves, it will drop twigs, it will drop flowers, it will drop seeds. There's no shortage of things that will drop off of this tree and make it the uh, messiest tree on earth. It does produce pink flowers, and I believe that's probably the reason that people plant it. The pink flowers grow at the top of the tree, so if it's in your yard, you probably can't see it. If there are people that live higher than you, they can look down and see the flowers on the tree in your yard, but they don't have to clean up the mess. So it's a great for your neighbors that live at a higher elevation than you. And there's that little pink flower there. Next is the uh, Chinese pistache. This tree, uh, relatively slow growing, uh, but is one of the few trees in Santa Clarita that you're sure to get fall color from. It will get nice reds and yellows and crimsons uh, in the fall uh, before the leaves fall. It's a great tree. This is one of the best trees that we could plant here in Santa Clarita and also has one of these rather large canopies but relatively small non-invasive root system. And there we see the color, the fall color. So if you're from back east and you wanted to enjoy some fall color here in Santa Clarita, uh, I think this would be the best choice for you. Now, it's a pistache, not a pistachio. If you want to grow pistachios, there's a different species. It's called pistachio vera, V-E-R-A. And those will give you the pistachio nut. Just keep in mind, you have to have a male and a female to get fruit. Okay. Next tree here is the Chinese fringe tree, relatively small tree. I don't think I've seen it uh, more than 20 feet high and wide. Usually a single trunk, but can be multi-trunk. Uh, drops its leaves in the winter and has beautiful white flowers on it. Uh, and that's really the, uh, the reason that people would want to plant this. Uh, quite pretty and uh, will grow almost anywhere, including in uh, a lawn area or in a small planting area, parkway, etc. Here's a close up of the flowers. And as you can see, quite pretty. Oh, next is the honey locust. This is a uh, tree 
that actually has yellow foliage. Um, in other words, when the leaves come out, they're kind of yellowish, which is different for certain. Uh, I've seen this tree grow almost anywhere in Southern California, including in the desert. In fact, it happens to be one of the more popular trees in the desert, even in uh, parking lots and parking strips, uh, because it can take the heat quite well and uh, makes it uh, makes it a pretty good tree in very, very hot areas. Uh, as you, if you read there, you'll see it performs best in areas of hot summers and cold winters. So the Antelope Valley, uh, maybe Acton, Aguadulce, would be uh, a good choice for this tree. And here are some of the varieties. Uh, Sunburst is one of the most popular because of its golden yellow foliage. The Shade Master is an upright tree and grows rather quickly. Oh, now I think we're going to talk a little about palms now because they are part of the tree kingdom. And uh, not all palms are created equally. Uh, so choose your palm carefully. This first palm here, the windmill fan palm, is a, a very nice palm. Typically single trunk, slow growing, uh, doesn't outgrow the area. Uh, after a few years, you won't walk out into your front yard and think that somebody has planted a telephone pole in your yard, which is what you will get if you plant other varieties of palm. So this one is uh, kind of nice. Uh, this is, you can see that it's planted here in a parkway. Sometimes they plant several of them together in the great and medians or smaller areas because they don't have a huge root system. They're also one of the hardier palm as far as temperature goes. So you may see them in Palm Springs and Palm Desert and other areas like that. It produces, as all palms do, produces some fruit, but it's not as messy as some of the other palms we'll talk about. This is the Mediterranean fan palm. This is a beautiful palm, usually grown in groupings or clumps. Um, very nice plant, slow growing. And uh, can be grown in uh, open areas like this or upright. Uh, they will grow slow, so you don't have to worry too much about them growing out of house and home. But uh, certainly, uh, there we go. That's a beautiful clump of them right there. And, and most often, that's how they're grown, as a, as a group of them together. And since they are slow growing, it's not going to cost you a fortune to hire somebody to climb up and prune it. Now, here's the palm that is uh, certainly, uh, dare I use the word, overdone. Uh, but uh, certainly you're going to see them everywhere when you drive around Santa Clarita. And uh, rather fast growing, but uh, when they're young, people don't uh, realize that this palm could get to 50 feet tall, which means you would have to call somebody every year to come prune it. It also produces a fruit. And this fruit, if it's 30 or 40 feet up in the air, is very difficult to remove. And it, when it produces the fruit, it makes a tremendous mess underneath. So I think that most people that planted them 20 or 30 years ago
probably wouldn't plant them again today if they had to do it over again. And you can see the fronds that are quite long, 12 feet, not out of the question, and they will hang down off the tree. Uh, so obviously the tree looks better when it's uh, pruned, and you may want to choose the time to prune it at or about the same time that it starts to produce fruit so you don't get the mess from the fruit. Now this is the exact opposite here. Here we have one of the smaller palms, the sago palm. It's uh, slow growing. Typically a single trunk grows from the center out. Uh, the leaves can stick out rather far so you want to be sure not to put this near a walkway or driveway. Uh, they are rather pokey, uh, not very user friendly. So if they're back off uh, from the walkways and sidewalks and driveways, uh, you should be okay with them. Uh, they tend to do better with less than full sun. Morning sun seems to be ideal. Uh, when we get those heat waves here in Santa Clarita, they tend to burn these plants. So uh, planting them maybe on the east side of the house or the north side, where they would get sun just in the morning might be good. And there's the uh, fronds of the palm. Next, we're going to switch over here to the evergreen pear. It's called evergreen because in the mildest of winters, uh, most of the leaves stay on the tree. Some do fall off. And actually, if your tree drops, if we have a cold winter and your tree drops all of its leaves, you'll actually get a better flowering uh, the coming spring. And that's what the tree is known for its early spring blooms. It, it, when the blooms come on, the whole tree will appear to be white. And the uh, bees tend to uh, congregate to the flowers and Unfortunately, the bees quite often bring a disease called fire blight, which is very difficult to control. You may want to read about fire blight before you consider getting a pear tree. Uh, one advantage of the tree is that it can be espaliered or trained along flat surfaces. This is another variety of pear. It is said to be a little more resistant of the fire blight. Another advantage of it is that it does get some fall color, very nice fall color. And uh, after the leaves fall, once again, it'll get those pretty white flowers on it. Here's a picture of the leaves in the fall. And uh, as you can see, it's uh, quite nice. Once again, another choice for fall color in Southern California. And those are the leaves. <clears throat> there are some different varieties. If you were going to plant one, I would suggest you uh, try to find out which one has the greatest resistance to fire blight. Prunus carolina, or carolina cherry, it's a nice tree. can be planted as an individual large tree or shrub, or as a hedge. Uh, doesn't require a whole lot of upkeep. Uh, you can see it as a hedge, and uh, it'll do quite well. There are a couple other varieties of cherry shrubs uh, that uh, one variety is native to uh, Southern California here. There's another variety that's native to 
Catalina Island. And the other varieties actually do produce an edible fruit. I don't think that uh, this one produces a fruit that I would call edible. Not terrible, just not very tasty. And there are compact varieties of this plant that uh, if you wanted to use a hedge that didn't get much over six to eight feet tall, might be a very good choice for you. Now we'll go from that small tree to one of the larger trees, the Magnolia grandiflora. This tree is evergreen, but drops a lot of leaves in the spring. Some people find it to be a little bit messy when that happens because the uh, leaves are quite large as you're probably familiar with the magnolia. The leaves can be up to six inches long, kind of leathery. Uh, but the white flower is what uh, tempts people. So when you plant a young tree, it'll be several years, but eventually you will get uh, a beautiful tree with white flowers. Leaf drop, it says, is almost constant. And that's particularly true in spring and early summer. But if, it, if you have the space, you can plant this in a, in a lawn area. And there's a close-up of the uh, beautiful white flowers. Now, since most people don't have room for a 50 to 60 foot tall tree, they may want to consider some of the smaller varieties, like the St. Mary. The St. Mary's is a nice small variety that grows up to about 20 feet. And the little gem is another nice small tree. Uh, small root systems, uh, very pretty trees. Yeah, they, they would fit in most yards. Next is the purple leaf plum. This uh, tree used to be very popular. I say used to be because um, they die at a fairly young age. This is one of the shortest lived trees that we have. Typically about 15 years. Uh, they were bred for the purple foliage. Uh, and so they were bred for that and they weren't bred for a, a long life. But if you wanted to have a purple leafed tree in your yard for a short period of time, uh, this one will be a good choice. Now, as the tree ages, as it gets closer to its uh, end time, it will actually produce a fruit. Uh, the fruit is edible. Uh, I've eaten them. Uh, so it does produce a fruit. Uh, could be messy. But uh, like I say, if you if you wanted that, uh, just keep in mind, you, you won't have it for too terribly long. Now, after it drops its leaves in the winter, it puts on these white or pink flowers that are uh, quite attractive. And there are different varieties. Uh, as you can see there, the entire tree is just covered with flowers in the early spring. Now we have an Italian stone pine, one of the larger pines, and a pine that gets wider than it gets high, which is very unusual for uh, pine trees. Most pine trees have a center leader that runs straight up through the middle of the tree. This one begins to uh, branch out and arch out, uh, making it actually very popular in parks in areas like that, where it can spread out. You can get some shade from it uh, and you can walk underneath it. Usually has a very large trunk, uh, large root system too, very large root system. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, most of us don't have room for a tree this size. But if you have lots of uh, acreage, it's a, it's a good choice for pines. Next is the Elderica pine. 
are called the Afghan pine. Uh, there's other names, Pinus frutea. Uh, very adaptable. In fact, this has actually been planted up in the uh, uh, mountains to replace some of the native pines that uh, have fallen to the beetle. This particular variety, mostly upright, uh, and doesn't seem to be as bothered by the beetles as other varieties. But coming from Afghanistan, it'll tolerate the wind, the heat, the smog, dry soils. Uh, one of the toughest pine trees out there. Now next is the Canary Island pine. Very tall tree. Uh, and relatively narrow. Uh, if you have seen these growing in parkways, and I see them a lot in the San Fernando Valley. One thing you'll notice about them is that the foliage tends to come out in tiers, making it a very unusual pine tree. Uh, the juvenile foliage comes out blue, kind of an interesting look, but eventually they get very large needles. Uh, and you can see that those needles are a good six to eight inches long, uh, which can produce quite a mess. They can, they can uh, ruin your gutters, uh, et cetera. So uh, think about that before you plant a uh, Canary Island pine. Next is the Diodar cedar. This is actually native. It's uh, native to, from the hills, the mountains of Southern California, all the way through the Sierras, clear into Oregon. Uh, very beautiful tree, green all year. Uh, nice uh, smell to the foliage. In fact, I've heard stories and read books about the early settlers they would cut a few sprigs from this cedar tree, lay them down, and then put out their their bedding. Not only would it smell nice, but it's uh, resist. It would uh, prevent insects uh, from coming around. This tree doesn't have any known insect or disease problems, uh, so very nice choice if you wanted an evergreen plant. Evergreen tree in your yard. And as you can see, mostly upright. And uh, there are some different varieties now, but uh, a tree that shouldn't give you any problems at all. Now, the giant sequoia. Yes, this is the one that grows up in sequoia and Yosemite. Uh, huge tree. Uh, once again, I don't know too many folks that have this or have room for this tree in their yards. But of course, it's uh, very beautiful. And uh, this particular variety, the giant, is a slower grower than the redwood that uh, you might be thinking of, the coastal redwood. Uh, it's probably a little more durable, though, than the coastal redwood. The coastal redwood tends to do poorly if it's more than 10 or 15 miles in from the coast. It's got a beautiful trunk to it, though. And uh, if you had the room for it, if you lived up in the mountains, say Big Bear or someplace like that, uh, this might be a good choice. Okay, here's a plant that was very popular throughout the 1950s and into the 60s, the uh, Italian cypress. Uh, and that's what you get with an Italian cypress, just straight up and down. They don't get too terribly wide. Uh, they can be grown as a hedge, a windbreak. Uh, they, they take the heat. They're very drought tolerant. In fact, one of the ways that people kill these is by uh, watering them too frequently. If you were to water these more than once a week, 
uh, well, you'd be wasting water, but you might also hurt the tree because they're just used to hot, dry conditions. There you can see them growing as a hedge, and they can be trimmed. They can actually be trimmed as a short hedge if you like. And there are some narrower and smaller and slower growing uh, varieties. If you didn't want one that was going to get 50 feet tall. Now the Cedrus deodor. This is another huge evergreen tree. Uh, you'll see it in the parks. Uh, you'll see it over at Hart Park. Uh, very big tree. Uh, once again needs a whole lot of space. As you can see, this one tree is taking up the entire yard in this residence. Uh, it's green all year, so that means it's going to produce shade underneath it all year, which may make it difficult or impossible to grow grass underneath it. The lower branches are often trimmed off so that you can walk underneath it. Um, it does have shallow roots that spread quite wide and those roots don't like to be disturbed. Uh, cutting the roots will harm the tree. There are new varieties of deodar and different varieties of cedars that are quite beautiful and you may want to consider them for a smaller tree, uh, a tree that maybe doesn't get up to 60 feet tall. You may look into other varieties of cedar that will grow here and uh, are drought tolerant and love the sun and the heat. This one right here, for instance, the Cedrus Atlantica. Beautiful blue foliage, <clears throat> a little slower growing than the other cedars, but uh, very nice, very uh, architectural, just beautiful. Can be grown in the container for a number of years. There you can see it's been pruned to be uh, interesting. And there it is left unpruned and fully mature. Now the uh, thujas, are a, a plant that are, well, they're, they seem to be making a rebound. They were very popular back in the 60s and 70s with the Italian cypress and the juniper. Now they're becoming more popular as people have realized that perhaps the Italian cypress and the junipers and Leyland cypress were uh, not a great choice. This is a good evergreen shrub or small tree that um, will provide a windbreak or a screen, uh, makes a nice hedge. And there are some new varieties uh, that have some yellow tint to them or dark green. Uh, so they are making a comeback now. And as you can see, they don't have needles. So they're not as pokey as some pines or some other evergreens. Now we're getting to a very pretty tree here, the forest pansy redbud. This is a wonderful family of trees, Circes. Uh, all of them take the sun and the heat, they round headed, and most of them get red flowers, but there are some that produce pink or white flowers grown as a single or multi trunk. And the foliage is beautiful, heart shaped leaves. The, the forest pansy variety is a variety that was typically found in the mountains uh, near or under other trees. So this is what we call an understory tree. Uh, it might be found underneath the oaks or some of the uh, taller pines. And of all the varieties of redbud, 
this would be the one that I would avoid planting just right out in the middle of the yard. Much better in a more protected area. For areas out in the yard, mm -hmm. the Oklahoma and the native variety and the Mexicana are fantastic. Uh, the Oklahoma is a beautiful tree. One, one of the prettiest trees in nature produces a wine red flower, beautiful heart-shaped leaves, a nice round head, uh, absolutely nothing that I can say about that tree that could be even slightly negative. The Occidentalis is the native that grows up in the uh, Sierras. Uh, you'll see it every time you go to Yosemite or Lake Tahoe. It's a beautiful, beautiful variety. Another native is the Palo Verde. This particular variety is a hybrid that was developed at the Desert Museum in Tucson, Arizona. It is a natural hybrid, meaning that it was uh, a cross between several varieties of what we call Palo Verdes. It has the nice green trunk of the Palo Verdes, but without any thorns. It's got beautiful yellow flowers for a longer period of time than any of the other Palo Verde species. It also grows faster and at this time does not have any known problems or issues. So I would put this at the top of your list with the Oklahoma redbud. Now the blue Palo Verde is native to the deserts of Southern California in Arizona. Uh, I'm not sure that I would recommend this because the Desert Museum would have any of the nice attributes of this plant plus many more and not have the thorns, uh, which is a distinct advantage. And there are the beautiful yellow flowers that all of the Palo Verdes have. Here's a tree. Now we have a native mesquite that's native to the deserts in Mexico. This particular one is native to Chile. And this variety was hybridized because of the lack of thorns. So if you're going to be buying a mesquite tree, make sure that you pick one that does not have thorns uh, because the natives are very thorny. They all have this beautiful fern type foliage. They tolerate extreme heat and extreme drought. And they will do well with little or no summer water and uh, no fertilizing whatsoever. In fact, when I, when I've seen these trees get regular water, they actually grow too big and too fast. And some of the varieties actually produce a what's called a catkin or a male flower. And there's a variety that actually produces a seed pod that is edible. Okay. Next, the raywood ash tree. Uh, not a bad tree. Upright, mostly upright and taller than it is wide. It is a uh, another hybrid. And one of its claim to fame is that it does have a smaller root system than any other type of ash tree. So it's great in parking structures or smaller areas. Um, it does produce beautiful fall color. So, We've seen a few trees now that uh, have fall color. And uh, if you were to plant all three of the trees that we've seen with fall color in your yard, you would think you were in New England come October. 
Next is the evergreen ash, and I can't recommend this tree for any reason at any time for anybody. This used to be very popular for trees that wanted to, uh, for folks that wanted a fast growing tree. There's nothing faster. And there's also just about nothing bigger, 80 to 100 feet high, 60 to 80 feet across. This would cover several houses in our suburban areas. Also has roots to match, massive roots that will cause damage not only to your house, but your neighbor's houses and your neighbor's driveways and your neighbor's plumbing. Notorious for surface roots. Yep, I, I just don't think this is a tree you want to plant. But you may see it as you're driving around. You see the huge, huge tree. And you wonder, what is that? You're probably looking at an ash tree. The Arizona ash is a native ash, uh, not nearly as large. Uh, doesn't seem to get the insects, diseases, or the huge root system of the evergreen or shamal ash. And in fact, sometimes this tree is used to graft other types of ash on because it is a, a very durable tree. But it still has the surface roots. It gets you some yellow fall color and does produce some seeds that once again could be a problem. Now here's a very popular tree now and for good reason. This is the Arbutus and there's a couple of varieties. The Marina is typically a tree type and the Unido is typically a shrub type. Takes the sun, takes the heat. Uh, you'll see it throughout Santa Clarita now uh, because the city has been planting it because it does have very few problems and has this beautiful red trunk. Uh, as long as you've got a well draining soil, you can plant this thing. If you've got thick red clay that does not drain, this tree isn't for you. And it does produce a, a red berry. That's why it's called the strawberry tree. Although I don't think anybody grows this plant so that they could eat that berry. I've done it, but uh, you have to be pretty hungry. Here's another native, the uh, Toyon, or Christmas holly tree. Uh, this tree is how Hollywood uh, got its name. Uh, it can be grown as a large shrub and is green all year. Uh, very durable, obviously, being a native and uh, produces these beautiful berries. Uh, that will stay on it up till winter time. And there they are. Thus the California holly tree. This tree, I, I'm uh, leery of recommending it. Uh, it does grow, there's no question about it. It'll grow in the hottest climate known to man comes from South Africa. Uh, it's evergreen. Produces a little flower. It's uh, relatively small. And there's the flower and the leaf. Uh, the problem I have with it, though, is once you have it, it won't let you ever get rid of it. It will produce uh, suckers or shoots off of its root system and I have seen it where somebody has attempted to remove one and the following year they had 10 trees instead of the one. So keep that in mind before you plant it. That's why I said at the beginning of this 
presentation that trees are the most important part of our landscaping, but they can also be the biggest mistake we make when landscaping. Now, the uh, Grecian laurel is a very small plant. Uh, here it says 20 to 40 feet tall. That might be true if you went to the Mediterranean region and found a 200-year-old tree. But here in Santa Clarita in Southern California, I seldom see them more than 12 feet tall or so. Uh, and this is the bay tree that uh, is used in cooking. Usually just grown as a single plant because how much spaghetti can one person eat? And there it is, topiary rather nicely. Uh, so we'll take pruning and uh, takes the sun and the heat quite well. And there's the flowers. Next is the Brisbane box tree. It comes from Australia, but doesn't have all the problems that the eucalyptus has. Eucalyptus are a dreadful tree to be planting. Uh, just so many problems with them, broken branches, uh, insects, uh, incredible root systems. Uh, but this one, the Brisbane box, doesn't seem to have any of those problems. It's a nice upright tree. Doesn't have a ridiculously large root system. It's green all year. Uh, has beautiful bark. Uh, can be used almost anywhere. Uh, and there is a new variegated uh, variety of it that has a green and yellow spots on the leaf. Next is the Iriobotry or bronze loquat, evergreen tree with very large leaves. Um, and then new leaves, it's called the bronze loquat because the new leaves, when they come out, have this bronze tint to them. It uh, has a nice looking trunk to it. It's a small tree. And here you can see it's being used as a stoop tree. I believe this is probably Santa Barbara. The Iriobotria japonica is the fruiting variety. And if you like the fruit, this tree will produce it. It's a evergreen, medium-sized tree, usually as tall as it is high, and produces clusters of this orange fruit that is actually very tasty. And uh, if you didn't like the fruit, you probably shouldn't plant the tree, but if you like the fruit, it's beautiful. And for a number of years, it can be planted in a container, can be kept small with pruning, um, but uh, great if you love the fruit. It's got three or four large seeds in it there and uh, is delicious. Okay. Next is a small, this is a small tree or shrub, uh, typically eight to 10 feet high and wide. I don't think I've ever seen one 25 feet tall, but uh, it's evergreen. Doesn't seem to have any problems and produces these pink flowers in the spring. Uh, it is a hybrid between two varieties of evergreen plants. Uh, it says here that it is susceptible to fungal leaf spot and possibly fire blight. That's a problem if it's watered too much or if it's in a damp area. But if it's in a dry area, sunny area, you shouldn't have these problems. And there's a close-up of the, uh, the flowers. Now the Robinia, uh, be careful which variety you get with this one. Because 
There are different varieties, some of which are native, and the natives have re just ridiculous thorns from the trunk all the way up to the smallest twigs. Uh, there are some flowering varieties uh, called, I think, Joseph's coat or uh, something of that nature that produces a blue flowering variety. Uh, was very popular in uh, Santa Clarita. They planted a lot of them in canyon country. Uh, but they did find that if they were disturbed or planted too deeply, they produced an abundance of suckers, which, of course, had the thorns on them. The you know, purple robe has the showiest flowers. Uh, rather pretty. Rather pretty flowers. Now, the Melaleucas, once again, there's several varieties. They come from Australia. They have nice looking trunks, white trunks with uh, what's called exfoliating bark, which is uh, very pretty. Yeah, you can see it there. And uh, they do produce uh, flowers. They are green all year. That's the flowering there. Uh, be careful which variety you choose. Some have larger root systems than others, and they can be susceptible to freezing. So I know we haven't had any cold winters for a while, but that doesn't mean that we couldn't get one. The Chautauqua. This is a native, well, a cross between a native Chilopsis and the Chautauqua, which is uh, native to multiple areas, including our Midwest, uh, but apparently also uh, in Russia. But this particular, the Chilopsis linearius, is the desert willow. And when it was crossed with this plant, it produced a round-headed plant, quite often with a single trunk and pink flowers. Um, it, it was quite popular maybe 10 or 20 years ago, but uh, now uh, they found that it can be kind of messy. It doesn't like to be watered very much, doesn't like to be fertilized. And if it's near a lawn area or an area where there is a lot of moisture, it can get powdery mildew. There are varieties of Chalopsis, new varieties, new hybrids that produce beautiful flowers, pinks and purples, without the mess of the Chautauqua. So if you like the look of this flower, you may want to look up the Chalopsis and some of the hybrids, uh, which are one of the parents of the Chautauqua. And here is the parent right here. And I have seen these, the native, growing out in the washes in the desert. Uh, so obviously, extraordinarily drought tolerant, loves the heat and the sun. And uh, the uh, flowers are very pretty, and the hummingbirds love them. And uh, I know the one in front of my house has hummingbirds on it from spring to winter. And they love these flowers. And some of the newer varieties have deep purple flowers. Some uh, new varieties that they've developed don't have uh, the seed pods because the seed pods can be unsightly. But uh, the flower and the durability and toughness of this tree uh, makes it a worthwhile tree. Now we're just going to talk about a few shrubs here that uh, are, once again, pretty much, unless I say otherwise, they're all going to be evergreen, they're going to be drought tolerant, uh, and have very few problems. The abelia comes in a white or a pink variety, a kind of an arching type of shrub, can be anywhere from three feet to six feet tall, and there are some new hybrid varieties. 
Berberus. We don't see this too much anymore, but it's an, what we call an understory plant. It tends to do best when it's planted near or under some other trees and shrubs. It will get some nice foliage, red foliage in the summer, uh, but it does have some thorns to it right there. So it's oftentimes used kind of as a uh, hedge uh, or barrier uh, because uh, nobody wants to walk through that. And uh, uh, most dogs don't want to use this plant if you get my drift. Next is the boxwood. And this is a very common hedge uh, that we see everywhere. Uh, it can be kept anywhere from two feet to four feet as a nice looking hedge. Doesn't have any problems unless you overwater it. Once again, if you water it more than once a week, uh, you can get crown rot or root rot, I'm sorry. But if you water it, put it on the regular schedule of once a week, deep irrigation, uh, it will do fine. There are some new varieties that have darker green or smaller leaves, uh, but they all make very nice hedges. Okay. Next is the yellow bird of paradise. Uh, great sun-loving, heat-loving, drought-loving shrub native to South America. And it produces beautiful yellow flowers with red catkins. Very durable plant. Uh, it's very nice. Uh, this particular particular variety produces a seed pod that you could take the, the seeds from and plant new ones. It's uh, quite easy to propagate that way. Next is the bottle brush. You've probably heard of these plants. They're not quite as popular as they used to be, uh, but they were grown because of this flower right here, and thus the name bottle brush. It can be uh, used as a barrier uh, tall hedge, or an individual tree. Thrives on neglect. Uh, in other words, you plant it, get it going, and then walk away. There are some new varieties, including a dwarf variety called Little John, uh, that you'll find the city is planting everywhere, including in the parking mediums, because it's a very small, compact little plant with, once again, the... Uh, bottle brush flowers. Camellias. Now, this is a shade loving plant. It's one of the few that we have in our discussion here. They can grow on the east or north side of a building. They like an acidic soil, so they ought to use a lot of peat moss or uh, the correct type of planting that's with them, and they like to have the soil kept acidic, but you can do that with uh, soil, sulfur, and uh, some uh, fertilizers that are designed for this. They're quite popular underneath trees. For instance, at Wisconsin Garden, they grow them underneath the oaks and the redwoods. And many, many, many different varieties, mostly in pinks, whites and reds and just one of the prettiest flowers in nature. The sasanqua is more of a shrubby type plant. Wider than it gets high, a little tougher. It will take some more sun and more heat than the other variety, the japonica, uh, and has smaller leaves, dark green leaves, it, it still needs the acidic soil, though, uh, that the all camellias need. And its flower is more open than the other varieties. Next is the rock rose. This is an evergreen the shrub. Grows well on hills, dry, rocky, sunny hills. Um, 
comes in a bunch of different colors, pink being the most popular, but it does have red, reds and whites and lavenders now. There's a white variety of it. Uh, prefers drought, if you can imagine that. It likes a well-drained soil. That's why we see them on slopes uh, so often. Uh, they could tolerate a little shade, but they also grow well in full sun. And this is a purple variety. And they have come up with uh, varieties that are much more compact now. And uh, some with some different flowers. The Cachoni Aster is a spreading plant, once again. Great on a slope. Great as a low growing ground cover. Produces the berries and white flowers that the birds like. This particular variety is a, a prostrate variety. It's, it's a grow right along the ground and uh, gives you very few problems. The silverberry, uh, evergreen shrub with a uh, yellowish, dark green, almost variegated type leaf. And it is grown uh, for that, for the very colorful leaf. Uh, it's very durable, can take the sun or the heat. And there's that leaf, as you can see, kind of gold tinged with dark green. We'll take heat, we'll take cold, we'll take just about anything you want to throw at it. And there are some newer varieties, some with silver edging instead of the gold. Next is Escalonia. Um, not quite as popular as it was years ago. Uh, it does produce a beautiful little pink flower, but has to have absolutely well-drained soil and will not tolerate overwatering. Uh, but with well-drained soil and with deep but infrequent watering, uh, it, it can do quite well. And there's a couple of newer varieties like the Newport News that stays very compact. So great choice. Uh, particular now that we can't water every day of the week, this plant will have a chance to survive. The Euonymus, uh, you've probably seen different varieties of this, the evergreen. This particular variety is the golden tinged variety, and they have some that are silver tinged. They're uh, just wonderful plants in full hot sun and heat. They can be trimmed or they can be left to their own devices. And there are varieties that are completely green, some varieties with silver on the edges and some with gold on the edges. Just don't plant them in the shade. Uh, they will get mildew. And here's a Another wonderful large shrubby type plant called the pineapple guava. And as the name indicates, it produces a fruit that looks like a guava and tastes like a cross between a pineapple and a banana. A very tasty, very tasty fruit. It can come as a multi trunk, which is very, very attractive, or as a single leaf. Uh, it also has green foliage with gray underneath. So kind of uh, interesting foliage and white edible flowers. The, the flowers are delicious. Just the white part though, not the red stamens. So good choice uh, and edible fruit. Hollies, not quite as popular as they uh, once used to be. Uh, they do produce berries and uh, flowers. They are green all year. The hot, dry summers that we we get here in Santa Clarita have 
shown that the most varieties of the holly would prefer some shade, particularly in the late afternoon. Uh, morning sun is wonderful for them. And uh, they do produce the pretty berries and have evergreen leaves. And there are multiple varieties, many, many varieties of this uh, holly plant. Next is lantana. I think we all know lantana. We all probably have lantana in the landscaping. There are ground cover types that stay quite low. They hug the ground. They love the heat and the sun. And then there are upright varieties that'll grow four, five, six feet tall. And they come in multiple colors, reds, yellows, pinks, very durable, loves the sun, loves the heat, does not like water, and does not like food. Here's the, one of the bush types or upright types right here has the mixed colored flowers. So that'll give you reds, oranges, and yellows, uh, all in the same flower on the same plant. Uh, they do love uh, the sun and the heat, like I say. We, we, when we do get those occasional cold winters, uh, I have seen them freeze back. Uh, but as soon as the spring comes, they'll come right back. Now here's a tree that almost every yard has, or I'm sorry, not tree, shrub that every yard has. Now uh, the wax leaf privet, a hedge green all year, uh, makes a nice hedge, and that's typically what it's used for. Uh, can take sun or shade. It doesn't need much water. Uh, nice dark green foliage. The wax leaf privet. I wouldn't be surprised if most of you have them in your yard right now. Now, we saw the large evergreen magnolia tree earlier. This is the deciduous shrub type variety. And its claim to fame is that after all the leaves fall off in the winter, beautiful pink flowers will appear on a tree without any leaves. So that's very attractive, and that's what it's grown for. Not so much its leaves, but the, the beautiful flowers. And uh, they, they come in whites, pinks, and purples, and they're very stunning in February when they're blooming. The Mahonia, uh, the Chinese holly, uh, once again, not used too much anymore. Uh, the leaves are very pokey, so it was used as a hedge uh, or barricade, if you would, uh, because nobody's going to walk through that. And once again, there, I think you can see that each of the leaves is pointed. Uh, this would prefer shade in a well-drained soil, occasionally used as a barrier or screen, and for very good reason. The myrtle. Uh, evergreen, small. There's different varieties, uh, some which are very compact and stay quite small. Uh, others which can get up to, well, I, I think I've seen them six feet, maybe seven feet tall. And Pretty foliage uh, can take shearing, and if you don't prune them, you'll see the flowers. Sometimes when these plants are pruned a lot, you, you'll never get a chance to see the flowers. But the uh, Myrtus communis and many varieties, the compact ones make nice small hedges, low hedges or low borders. Uh, very pretty evergreen type plant. The Nandina, uh, maybe you have this in your yard too, Heavenly Bamboo. Uh, it can be used all by itself as an individual focal point. It can be used as a hedge, very versatile. 
in many, many different varieties. And yes, so uh, it is important to warn you about the name. It is not a bamboo. It is not related to bamboo. I wish it didn't have that name in it uh, because bamboo, of course, has a uh, reputation well-deserved for being invasive and difficult to eradicate. Uh, not so with this particular plant. Its claim to fame is its beautiful foliage, typically with reds, yellows, oranges on the foliage. Some white flowers, uh, but it's, it's the foliage and the berries that uh, are its claim to fame. And here's just a small list of different varieties available. So say you wanted one that would only get two or three feet tall, you could find it. If you wanted one that would get six feet tall, you could find it. Osmanthus fragrance, called sweet olive because of its fragrance. It is not related to olives, but the flower is often considered to be the nicest smelling flower in nature. Almost like an orange blossom, but perhaps sweeter. So beautiful plant. Uh, well, beautiful flower, I used to say. The plant itself is, um, well, nothing distinctive about it. So a lot of people plant it against a wall or in your doorway where the individual plant itself isn't the focal point, but where they want to smell the beautiful uh, uh, fragrance. And half shade is exactly right. It would be wonderful with morning, morning sun or filtered sun. And there's that flower. Flower is rather small and insignificant. You're not going to say, oh, that's a beautiful flowering plant. But when you smell it, I think you'll, uh, you'll see that that is, in fact, its claim to fame. Next is the Photinia, uh, an evergreen plant. And its claim to fame is the deep burgundy red foliage that comes on in the spring. Sometimes it's called the red tip Photinia because of that. And there you can see it in the spring. And it's a beautiful hedge, very durable, likes well-drained soil and does not like water. So once again, watering it once a week would be more than enough. Uh, but a very pretty hedge. And there's a close-up of its foliage and that's why people plant it right there. The pittosporum, uh, mock orange. Uh, you might have this in your plant, in your yard right now. This plant has been around a long time. It's very popular. It stays put. It doesn't spread. It doesn't have invasive roots. Uh, it's just a nice green mounding plant. Low water requirements suffers if you water it too much. So once again, once a week should be sufficient. Nice green foliage all year. And there are a couple of new varieties. One that has a variegated leaf with some white in it. Uh, very pretty. Okay. Now here's an upright evergreen shrub or tree. Uh, the Podocarpus. And there are multiple varieties of this plant. Uh, all of them make excellent, excellent hedges. Uh, very few problems with this plant. Nice long leaves, almost a weeping type look to it. Uh, can take full sun or partial shade. Uh, can be grown as an individual upright plant. And there are as I mentioned, different varieties. The gracilia can get rather large. Uh, that'll become an actual large tree. The mephophila is slow growing, very tight foliage. And the new icy blue uh, ever is everybody's favorite now. Uh, it's got a, a variegated leaf and it makes a wonderful screen, uh, border, background, hedge, 
Yeah, you name it. Beautiful. It's the new icy blue protocarpus. Pyrocantha. Once again, not as popular as it used to be. Uh, it's known for its berries, its evergreen, and its thorns. The berries are quite pretty, and apparently the birds tend to like them. They thrive on the neglect, and uh, it's probably best that uh, you don't feed or water them very much. And that's what you grow them for, is the berries right there. And there are many new varieties, uh, some that are very, very low to the ground. Uh, if you wanted a little small hedge, once again with thorns, for whatever reason you'd want the thorns, you would get it with this plant. Next is a uh, Raphaelippus. Uh, no thorns on this plant, evergreen, produces flowers, and there's a dozen varieties, some with white, some with pink, some with reddish flowers. They're evergreen. Uh, they do produce a little berry after they flower. Very, very popular plant. And uh, many, many varieties here. It just depends what size plant you want. That would help you decide which variety you want. Uh, the city's also planting uh, quite a few of these, the compact varieties, uh, because they are very hardy and evergreen. They're planting them in the uh, medians and the parking strips. Uh, nice little plants. Next is the rosemary, and I think we're all familiar with that. Uh, this is a heat and sun loving plant. This can tolerate the hottest, driest areas in the yard, can be used as a ground cover, can be used as a shrub, can be used as a single plant, and this can be used for eating. If you uh, have a recipe that requires rosemary, this is the plant that uh, that you will use. It has beautiful blue flowers on it. It's green all year. Very attractive. Has very few problems. Um, seems to be fire resistant, deer and rabbit resistant. Uh, does produce get a little bug called a spittle bug, but uh, that shouldn't bother you. And there we see it growing as a ground cover. And once again, dozens of varieties uh, that will grow right along the ground if you want. Uh, great on a slope or a steep hillside. Uh, excellent plant. Very good plant. Star jasmine. Very, very common. Very popular. Can grow it as a ground cover or as a vine. You can take full sun or partial shade. Um, can be done, you can do just about anything with it. There it is growing as a uh, ground cover in a planter box. And of course, we're all familiar with the, uh, the flower, the uh, jasmine flower, which smells very nice. And there are some new varieties of it, uh, but star jasmine, very common plant, very uh, easy to use plant, uh, very versatile. Viburnum, not used quite as much as it used to be. It uh, doesn't take our full sun and heat out here. So it would prefer some shade in the afternoon. A uh, morning sun might be great for it. It's a medium-sized shrub, easily trimmed or held in place. And uh, evergreen foliage gets beautiful flowers on it. And there are different varieties. The spring bouquet, I think, is the most popular because it's the most profuse bloomer. West Ringia, oftentimes called the Australian rosemary, uh, is a bigger plant than the rosemary and produces white flowers. Once again, loves the heat, loves the sun, and is very drought tolerant. And in fact, does best with less water and little or no feeding. So you can plant it and not have to worry too much about it. If you wanted to trim it as a hedge or something, it can be done. 
and you really see its uh, white flowers on it, as opposed to the blue flowers of the uh, rosemary. And finally, the xylosma. Uh, evergreen, uh, can be grown as a hedge, can be grown as a tree. Uh, you can prune it to whatever you like. Uh, it can get as tall as you like. Uh, when you pick out a variety from the nursery, make sure you pick a variety that is thorniest uh, because these can be real pokers. Uh, there you can see them trimmed up so that you can work underneath them and the foliage up at the top. Okay, that was the last of the slides. So now I'm going to see if there's any questions that anybody had. Are sagos toxic for pets? Uh, the answer, I would have to say that the answer to this question is, how could a pet eat a sago palm? I'm not at all certain that that could be done. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know how it could be harmful to a pet. Unless, unless a pet was to take a running jump from way back and jump right up into the plant. They'd get poked for sure. Okay. Um, next, let's see what we have here. Um, if there are, let's see if we've got any more questions. Laura, do you see any questions? I do not see any questions, John. Um, thank you so much. Um, I do want to share my screen really quickly, as promised. I want to share next year's um, calendar. Yes, and um, you did mention at the beginning of the presentation that next month's class will be live, that we will be inviting people. Am I right? Stop yes. me if I'm wrong. We'll be inviting people to participate up at the water district up above um, Central Park, and it will be a pruning class, and we'll do some hands-on pruning. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, the details have not been completely worked out yet, but it will be up at our headquarters. Um, but yeah, we will have four classes in person next year, kind of quarterly, but it'll be January, March, June, and then in October as well. Um, take a screenshot of this screen if you'd like. Um, you will be receiving it as well in your bills this month. Um, and it comes in a card if you want to save that. Um, next year, um, we kind of tried to mix up our classes a little bit. We have some new classes as well, such as elements of designing a sustainable landscape. That one we will actually have um, designers in in person so that you can design your, your if you want to go for the lawn replacement program, you can, they can help you design that um, free of charge. Um, but yeah, I'm super excited about next year's classes. I'm very excited to see some of you in person. Some of you have attended our classes every single month. So I would love to meet you in person um, because you have your attendance. So thank you so much. Um, happy holidays and a happy new year. I hope to see you all in person in January. Please check um, our website towards the end of the month. We are getting a new website later this month. Um, so it'll be a new look, but I encourage you to check that out and check out our landscape and gardening workshops um, page. And thank you, John, um, for all the information you shared today as well. All right, thank you, Laura, and thank you, uh, attendees. I hope to see you live and in person on January 7th uh, up at the uh, Water District headquarters. All right. all right, have a great one. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.